Well, with God's gracious help, we're going to turn this morning to the passage that we read from Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, verses 38 to 48. And in particular, verse 44, where Jesus says, quite simply, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Now the word of God is very clear that Christians live in what I will term a spiritual war zone. Our lives are a constant battle, aren't they, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And that means that we face many and varied enemies. And the Sermon on the Mount, of which this, this short passage forms a part, teaches us how we are to live as God's people in such a world, facing opposition, facing enemies, and walking with one another, and so on. But in these particular verses, Jesus is concerned about our relationship with those who hate us and those who are our enemies. And just one or two things to remember, even as we begin. Don't forget that if you are a Christian this morning, your enemies are your Lord's enemies. Jesus makes that very clear. He says, doesn't he, particularly in John's Gospel, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And then shortly after that, he also says, he who hates me hates my father also. Christian, don't be surprised if the world hates you. And in that sense, the world is your enemy. And I think it's also helpful as we think about this second great challenge of love to keep in mind both what we were as Christians and what we now are as Christians. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, you, he's writing to Christians, he's writing to a Christian church, you who once were, this is what you were, alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now, this is what you are, this is what you've become, now God has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, or the Lord has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, above reproach in his sight. You were enemies once of God, like those who are hating you. But you now have been reconciled to God. And as I have been pondering this, my prayer has been that the Holy Spirit will help me and will help you to learn this morning to walk worthy of the Lord, the one who reconciled us when we were enemies, that we might walk worthy of him fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So the challenge that comes to us this morning is very simply that we are to love our enemies. Now if it's not always easy to love one another, how much harder when Jesus says, love your enemies. 
There's only one way to do it. There's only one way to love one another. There's only one way to love our enemies. And that is to walk with the Lord in the light of his word. And so all I can do is bring you God's word on this matter. Not to point fingers at anyone. As I said last Lord's Day morning, to one or two, for every finger that points at you, there's three pointing back at me. If we're not into finger pointing. And we have to say that this loving one another and loving our enemies is not an option. It is an integral part of the Christian life and testimony. And how I then praise God and how you should be praising God this morning that you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Let's praise him even further that love for others is part of the fruit that he bears through our life. If it was not so, I couldn't be standing before you this morning. If it were not so, we might as well give up in despair. But Christian brother and sister, you have the Holy Spirit. There is no excuse for any of us. So let's just look, look at this thought about loving our enemies. And the first thing I want to say is this that loving our enemies requires great grace. It requires great grace. Listen to Jesus in verse 39 of Matthew chapter 5. I tell you not to resist. We must not respond to our enemies with retaliation. We must not respond to our enemies with resistance. Now that does not contradict in any way what James says when he tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from you. But we are not to rise up in resistance when our enemies challenge us. What are we to do? We are to place that enemy we are to place the whole situation and we are to place ourselves because we're involved, our enemies, our situation and ourselves into God's hands. It's James that writes in that practical letter, the Spirit gives more grace and because he gives grace, he says, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, in every situation, but particularly in a situation when an enemy is challenging us, we must submit to God. That's James 4, verses 6 and 7. Or Peter when he wrote, writes in his practical letter, in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Recognize God's hand in the situation and humble yourself under his hand. That he, when you have put yourself down into his hand, may exalt you, may lift you up in due time and do so how do we do that by casting all our care by casting this confrontation by casting this challenge upon him with confidence that he cares for us we are in God's hands therefore we are safe if we try to deal with our enemy in our own strength, we're in trouble. But when we cast the matter into, put it in his hands, we can with confidence say, but God knows and God cares 
about our enemy. So when you are challenged by an enemy, that's the first thing to do, to put the issue in his hands, God's hands. And yet at the same time, we are not foolhardy. We give due diligence. That's a favourite expression today. But Christians need to give due diligence. To what? In this situation, to Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 6, and put on the whole armour of God. We don't confront our enemy in our own, with our own resources. We confront that enemy dressed in the armour of God. And I'm not going to go through the armour of God to this morning. For the majority of you, if not all, you're aware of what that passage says. So we put on the protection that God provides and we wield the weapons that God provides against our enemy. And the weapon he has given us is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And don't forget the second weapon, the weapon of all prayer. All prayer. That's Ephesians 6, 17 to 18. We show love for our enemy by not wielding carnal weapons, but spiritual ones. Because we want to see that enemy not dead at our feet, but falling at the feet of our Lord and Master. So uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are spiritual. And they are mighty in God. Yes, we walk in the flesh, but we do not war uh, according to the flesh. We don't behave and respond how the world behaves and responds. He hit me, I hit him. He hits me again, I hit him harder. No. We demonstrate love for our enemy, not by hitting him physically, but with spiritual weapons. And we look not for our own strength for protection, but to the weaponry of God, the protective armour that God gives us. And that requires grace. And where will you find grace? He giveth more grace. Who gives the grace? The Lord, our Saviour. He giveth more grace. As the burdens grow greater, as the warfare gets hotter, as the enemy gets stronger, he gives us more grace. And he gives it again and again and again because he knows we need it again and again and again. So loving our enemies requires great grace. Love for our enemies in the second place must be seen. It must be demonstrated that we love our enemies. That comes out in verses 38 to 45. And verse 44 is so, so strong, isn't it? I say to you, love your enemies. Show that you love them. How? Well, Romans 10 puts it like this. We don't repay anyone evil for evil. That's what the world does. So just apply and work out Jesus' own illustrations in these verses here in Matthew, Matthew 5. I'm just going to summarise them. We show selflessness rather than self-centeredness when we face our enemies. What do our enemies do? They retaliate and assert themselves when they are confronted. 
That's their natural reaction, but it's not our reaction. In verse 38, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Give as good as you get. That's the world. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Don't retaliate. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Show that you're concerned for that enemy. Not to bring him down, but that he should be changed. In verse 42, we show generosity to our enemy. Give to him who asks you. From him who wants to borrow, don't turn away. Do you see your enemy in need? Then you come alongside to help him. No, that's not what flesh wants to do. That's not what my nature wants to do. Me? Help that person? Never. But that's the world. That's not the Christian. You are to show compassion and love for our enemy when he's in need. During this past week, I've been reading a book that I picked up a little while ago. It's called Christ or Hitler. Written by a pastor, a German pastor. And I'll tell you when he lived. From 1897 to 1966 in Germany. Now, if you know your history, you'll know what those years cover, covered. He was a pastor, a pastor during the Weimar uh, situation, during that republic when inflation soared. You could buy a bun for two pfennig in the morning. It would be 200 by lunchtime. And it, it went on like that for months, years. And he was ministering into that situation and being ridiculed and scorned by those to whom he was ministering in the mines in Essen, in the Ruhr. Then what happened? The Republic, Hitler, Nazism. This man still continued to testify concerning the Saviour. He was seeing hundreds converted. But before that, in the First World War, he was in the trenches on the German side. And there, God converted him. And there, in the trenches, he was witnessing to his companions. And they were being converted. They were treating him like scum. And then, to move forward again, the Second World War, there is this faithful pastor working in the Ruhr. And if you know your history, you know how heavily bombed the Ruhr was, the heartland of industrial Germany. He was hassled by the Gestapo, imprisoned by the Gestapo. Yet, it's just a wonderful story how in prison, in, under the SS, he was witnessing constantly for Christ, being abused. And he came right through and he didn't die till 1966. And as I read that, I thought, well, here's a man. It was Christ or Hitler. That was where he lived. We don't hear many stories like that, do we? Not even on our own side, if I can put it like that, much less on the other side. But it is. This is what he was doing. And this was a tremendous challenge and example to me. Do I love my enemies to that extent? Doing so willingly, not under compulsion, even to our own detriment. In verses 43 and 4 of this passage, 
we show the opposite spirit, the opposite attitude to that of our enemies. We show love to them, not hate. We bless them and pray for them when they are cursing and reviling us. We seek their well-being, not their harm. We seek their salvation, not their damnation. Now I precede those verses, but that's basically what Jesus is saying. And we behave consistent with our prayerful desires by actually doing them good when they do us evil and harm. And that, must, that surely means, in essence, in the third place this morning, that love for our enemies must be Christ-like. It must be Christ-like. Impetuous Peter's words came to mind concerning his Lord. This is what you were called to, because Christ also suffered for us, doing what? Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, he was perfect. There was no deceit in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And that's where I began, wasn't it? Putting ourselves in God's hands. That's what Jesus did. Let's be Christ-like. Consider his life. From the moment of his birth, his enemies sought his destruction. From the moment of his birth, Herod sought to kill the infant Christ. As Jesus grew up and matured, we find him in the wilderness. The devil personally sought his downfall in the wilderness temptations. The religious and the political authorities constantly opposed him. Even his disciples challenged him sometimes. And when it comes towards the end of his life on earth, he was hated by both Jew and Gentile alike, as there in Jerusalem they cry out with one awful voice, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar, crucify him, crucify him. And yet our blessed Lord never, ever retaliated with like for like. He didn't, did he? You can't find that in the scripture. Yes, he spoke sharply, but he spoke in love. Yes, he sometimes spoke almost in a condemnatory way, but he did so in love. Consider his death, the mockery of a trial that was full of hatred and hypocrisy. The torture was extreme. The mockery was deep and cutting. The pain of, it, of crucifixion was excruciating. And yet, listen to the Lord stretched out on the cross as they're hammering the nails through his hands and his feet. Lifting up that cross and jolting it in its socket. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, are we Christ-like? Are we Christ-like when people laugh at us? when they oppose us comes home to me I hope it comes home to you and there he is hanging on the cross in, the, in that agony and there are two thieves mocking him 
There are those down below. He saved others. He can't save himself. And yet one of those mocking thieves. Today you will be with me in paradise, says the Lord. Just think of it. Today, before the day is out, you'll be with me in paradise. Now I know there's a lot behind that, but this is how our Lord treated his enemies. Consider our wicked world today. After all, we're living in the world today, aren't we? But we're living in a world that rejects God. In a world that rejects God's word. That refuses to walk in God's ways. And yet, the other day, it was raining. This morning, the sun is shining. God sends the rain and the sun on those who hate him. In other words, he sends what they need for daily life. And more than that, in divine grace and forbearance, he sends the gospel of his grace into our fallen society today. He does it through you and me. He came into the world to bring truth and grace. And he sends us to show truth and grace, his truth, his grace, into this world. But he hasn't withheld it from them. And yet, we would if we could, wouldn't we? They don't deserve it. No, they don't deserve it. And Jesus knows that better than anyone. Look as he drew near to Jerusalem. He looked out on that city that in a few days was going to take him, was going to do all that they did in what we call the Easter story. And as he looked at that city, he wept over it. He wept. If only, if only. And in that sense, he weeps over his enemies still. How can we hate our enemies? Let me bring it home. How can I hate my enemy when I read Romans 5 verse 8 how God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us that's the gospel isn't it this is the gospel do we live out gospel truth and yet he went even further he sent his Holy Spirit into the sewer of my heart. The pure Holy Spirit came into your heart, Christian, too, when it was still full of sin and filth. He had to, because he had to deal with it and bring us to repentance and bring us to faith. Christian, that's what the Holy Spirit did. The Son came into the world at the Father's behest and the Spirit came into our heart at their united request. And I would go even further still because I know and you know that we grieve the Spirit sometimes. Yet he doesn't leave, does he? He doesn't leave. An old writer put it he, like this. He doesn't leave. He withdraws into his withdrawing room so that we're not conscious of his presence. But he never leaves us.
And Jesus said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. It's profound, but it's wonderful. Ought we not to respond positively to the new commandment, which is therefore twofold? Love one another as I have loved you, and love your enemies too. And the Lord even gives us a personal incentive to love our enemies. He gives us an encouragement to do it, something to help us do it, something that we can grasp. And here's my fourth point this morning. Love for our enemies brings its reward. It's there in verses 45 through 8. <coughs> Loving one another, that's those who love us, brings a great reward, as Psalm 133 tells us. Where brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord doesn't send a blessing. He commands a blessing. It's a much stronger word. He doesn't just send it. He commands it. Where brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord commands the blessing. But when we love our enemies by the grace of God, the reward is amazing. Because verse 45 of Matthew 5 tells us this. When you've done what he says in verses 43 and 4, praying for, for them, loving them and so on, so that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. We demonstrate who we are to the glory of God, don't we? We show that we are not sons and daughters of this world anymore, but we are the sons and the daughters, we are the children of God himself. Because we're bearing a living testimony to our relationship with God as our heavenly Father. Loving our enemies demonstrates that we have and we, we have the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts and we love him as our elder brother. It shows to us, it shows to this world that we have been adopted into the family of God. That the Lord's prayer concerning us is answered. Father, I want them to be with me. And I'm going to the cross that it might be so. And that prayer is answered. You see, we are now bearing. That's why I began what we once were, enemies of God. What we now are, we are in the family of God. We bear the image and the likeness of our Heavenly Father. We Follow in the footsteps of Christ our Saviour. Put it another way, as Jesus does in verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, you will be complete, like our Heavenly Father and like our Lord. Now I'll never be perfect in, in the same sense as Jesus is. That cannot be. But when I love my brothers and sisters and love my enemies, I become like our Lord in his love, complete in love. Because I am then reflecting the love of God into the world. It doesn't emanate with me, does it? We saw that a few weeks ago. We love him because he first loved us. That draws out our love to him, which draws out our love to our brothers and sisters. And now it's made complete because we, we have love for our enemies. We begin to achieve the chief end of our being. What an incentive. 
to be like Christ in this world. What an incentive to achieve the chief end of man, to glorify God and enjoy him now and forever. To bring glory to God. And isn't that what you want to do, Christian? It's what I want to do. And this is how we do it. By loving one another and loving our enemies. I know there are subsidiary things, but those are the key things. The chief of these is love. If you like, 1 Corinthians 13 becomes a reality in our life, doesn't it? When we love not only one another, but our enemies too. 1 Corinthians 13 becomes a reality. There's an incentive. Do you want to live that chapter out? I do. Well, I want to close this morning by simply reading 1 Corinthians 13. Because this sums it all up. Let's just turn to it together. 1 Corinthians 13. And remember who's writing? It's the Apostle Paul. He's writing by inspiration. This is the word of God. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. <laughs> love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. <laughs> love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies they will fail, where, whether there are tongues they will cease, whether there is knowledge it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, that when that which is perfect or complete has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for your word. Sometimes, Lord, it hits hard. And not least of all, Lord, in this matter of love for one another and for our enemies. But Lord, we've just read how love suffers long and is kind, does not parade itself. Oh Lord, it rejoices in the truth and not in the evil and the wrong. Oh, help us, Lord, to have this love. Impress it upon us that we must be more Christ-like in our walk before this world and in our relationships with each other, only then can we reflect our Lord as we should. Oh, help us, Lord. We confess our failures. We confess our sinfulness. Lord, restore to us those days of our first love. Yes, when there was such joy in our salvation. Glorify yourself, Lord, 
forgive anything that's been amiss this morning. For Jesus' sake. Amen.